Okay, so um, <clears throat> it's a little unorthodox to give yourself your own introduction, but I'll, uh, I'll give it a whirl. Uh, yeah, as I said earlier, my, my name's James Phillips. I'm the general loudmouth for the movement here in the uh, UK. And I also, with my uh, girlfriend, Sarah, run a website called TZM Education in which we go into the schools of this country and pollute young minds into the ideas of science and technology for human concern. I'm, I'm deeply ashamed about that, but that's what we do. Um, hopefully you'll join us. <laughs> so, uh, so, so far we've heard a brief outline of uh, what the movement advocates as well as many of the paralyzing aspects in, which, uh, in the way in which our current system operates. So um, what I'm going to do with this presentation is to combine these effects to try to explain the model, that the, the socioeconomic model that the movement advocate and why we unfortunately still have to exist. It sounds kind of odd when you come to an organization's event and they stay, say stuff like, it's really crap that we have to be here, isn't it? Well, actually, we really would like to not be here and stop putting on these events, honestly. Uh, but for now, at least, it's extremely important that we do exist, and here's why. Because we'll need two Earths to keep our, on our current rates of consumption by 2030, and 27 to meet the projected rate of demand by 2050 if we stick to business as usual. We've lost roughly half our wildlife population's biodiversity in the past 40 years alone, and have passed four of the nine environmental markers that would make Earth inhospitable to human life. Roughly 15,000 acres of rainforest will disappear during this conference alone, and believe it or not, that's actually a conservative estimate. And on a social metric of sustainability, there's been some improvements in recent years, but there's still a billion people living in abject poverty on our planet, and the richest 85 people on it now have more wealth or money than the bottom 3.5 billion combined. The infamous 1% will soon control 50% of this planet's wealth, leaving the bottom 80% with a 5% share. The growing level of income inequality, constant need for increased consumption, um, is only made worse by creating money out of debt for, uh, by private interests, as mentioned earlier by Ben Dyson, which ensures periodic debt collapse. The global economic crash in 2008 uh, taught us, or at least it should have taught us, that thinking of any of our problems in isolation from one, one another is naive and outdated. Uh, not that you've heard any such rhetoric, of course, in this upcoming election campaign. We're apparently going to solve all of our economic woes without a single care or worry about what happens in America or China or anywhere else, because it's just all down to us, right? Clearly, it's not. According to a recent, uh, to a recent report by Oxford University, 46% of the current jobs could be gone in less than 20 years in America, with a similar effect around uh, in other developed nations. And uh, to echo what David was just talking about, remember that we don't need to lose all jobs to be in serious trouble. Uh, roughly 30% should do it. So this will, con even if your job's safe, what about other people's? This is going to be continue to become an increasing threat to the labor market which capitalism depends upon to function. And that is why it's unfortunate that we have to exist. Because in the midst of a culture clearly in a state of cumulative decline, very few of the well-intentioned and concerned activist organizations out there are actually standing back far enough to ask what the underlying causality is between these interconnected problems. We'll read it out. Yeah, whatever. Let alone present a long-term, realistic, workable alternative to start to address these issues. This is where the movement differs. Because we do present uh, a model capable of addressing the root cause of these issues. <clears throat> the question of the transition to this model will be addressed in more detail in Dave Lucas's presentation. Uh, but this is essentially why we're all here today to discuss ideas on how we can work together to create a new, this new system from within the old one. 
But the bottom line has to come down to the fact that just because it's difficult to get from A to B does not resolve the need to do so. So even if you don't see the merit in what the movement advocate at the end of today, I at least hope that you'll not leave here today with the idea that we can continue with business as usual and expect to solve any of these problems um, in the long run. I'm afraid inaction is just simply no longer an option, whether you're doing it for selfish reasons or altruistic ones. It really doesn't make any difference because systems are what they produce, not what we wish them to produce. And you can't solve, the problem, solve problems by using the same kind of thinking you used when you created them. So the real revolution has to be one of values, education and understanding of what science and technology could offer us if we are wise enough to use them for human concern. <clears throat> so, we're often... We're often dismissed for taking this uh, educational standpoint because apparently that's not doing anything. But that's like saying we shouldn't bother training brain surgeons and just let them learn on the job instead. Our entire way of life was never designed to be sustainable. So of course there has to be an educational value shift before we can move to something worthy of the title of a sustainable global civilization. So, TZM is a sustainability advocacy group, which, let's face it, doesn't really sound all that unique nowadays, does it? Everyone seems to use the word sustainability to describe themselves or their business. Very often with the objective of selling more of their particular product, which, unless it's made out of thin air, kind of defeats the entire premise of what it means to be sustainable. A truly sustainable slogan might be, don't buy this. In fact, don't buy anything unless you absolutely need it, because buying things you don't need with money you don't have to make impressions that won't last on people you don't know is not really going to help us be all that sustainable now, is it? <laughs> I like this one too. <laughs> but save the seagulls. Think of them. The insane quest for infinite growth on a finite planet, plus the myriad of other negative effects mentioned thus far, should hopefully show that the general zeitgeist clearly has no fucking idea what sustainability is, let alone how to achieve it. Therefore, the title of this presentation is Defining Sustainability, Part 1. Where did it all go wrong? Well, it didn't. This system's doing exactly what should have been expected of it. It's just taken this long to show its true colors. Because we emerged from times of great scarcity and hardship where the trading of goods and services with some abstract system of exchange was, in, was necessary for the labor or specialization endured. Fast forward to today and oil and fossil fuels have changed the way in which we live and is the principal reason that there's seven billion people alive on this planet today, whereas in 1850, there was little more than a billion. The coming together of a new source of energy, transportation and communication has always helped carve out the next shift in social, political and economic relations. The second industrial revolution helped bring about the technological capability to overcome the relative scarcity and inefficiency inherent to the need of the use of a monetary market system, allowing us for the first time to address some of the age-old problems plaguing our species of war, poverty, debt, and servitude inherent to the use of this competitive system of exchange. We're far more symbiotically connected than we could have ever intuitively recognized, and by Approaching problems as, uh, social problems as technical issues rather than monetary or political ones, we can, for the first time in our history, create an access abundance to meet human need, bringing about a seismic shift in every aspect of our personal and social relations. A common objection at this point usually surrounds some form of socially Darwinistic assumption regarding these negative tendencies being an unalterable part of our human nature. 
Putting aside the mountains of converging data sets that confound this perspective, let's just for a moment pretend that it's true. How should we go about arranging society if this were the case? Surely we wouldn't want a competitive social system which rewards such self-serving behavior, would we? That would be exceedingly stupid and just so happens to be exactly what we have today. <laughs> I actually have this on the back of my car and um, someone came up to me and they actually said, but I thought you didn't like buying stuff. <laughs> I said, I thought you understood irony. <laughs> anyway, so it does seem just a tad unfair to label mankind as naturally greedy inside a game in which our survival depends upon the acquisition of uh, funds from a limited pool of money in order to survive. With, <laughs> with so many unfounded and widespread beliefs such as this still in existence, it's no wonder that money is not seen as the changeable techno-economic tool that it is. Undoubtedly, its use has had an enormously beneficial effect on human society as well, of course, furthering trade and development, for example. But it's also helped to create a powerful neuroses in human relations and wider society as well, in a variety of different ways. For example, a study carried out by researchers at University of, Cali of Berkeley, California, found that by uh, uh, being wealthy predisposes individuals to act unethically by either cheating, stealing, or showing a lack of empathy towards others. The Merva Fowles study carried out across 30 metropolitan cities around the world with a total population of 80 million people showed that just a 1% increase in unemployment resulted in a 6.7% increase in homicides, a 3.4% increase in violent crime, and a 2.4% increase in property crime. To mention nothing of the plethora of negative effects that income inequality has on human health in a given society, as mentioned earlier. So, unlike what many people profess, money is not a neutral influence on social, political, economic, or personal relations, and just a mere tool to use as we see fit. Because built into its use is the requirement for scarcity, inefficiency, and hierarchy of some sort to exist making it simply impossible to achieve a sustainable, egalitarian, collaborative, and peaceful global civilization. Part two, a self-realizing tra train of thought. <clears throat> so in a competitive world of separate nations with different ideas over religion, philosophy, and politics, a worthwhile question might be, how are we going to get this clearly dysfunctional family to sort their shit out and work together? Perhaps uh, a, a better way of putting it might be, do we have a decision-making method that people from different backgrounds can come to agree upon eventually? When framed like this, the answer seems a little easier to find. As the scientific method has consistently shown its ability to bring people from different backgrounds to some sort of agreement eventually. The reason for this is because it's based on a repeatable empirical process that can be performed by anyone against the benchmark of the physical reality we all share. Helping us to arrive at decisions through observation and testing rather than making them arbitrarily through the flawed process of human thought alone. Although science has been responsible for the many amenities we've come to enjoy in modern life, it's never been applied to our social system in a holistic way. So the results of what could be achieved if it were applied without restriction would be mind-blowing. So let's walk through a brief thought exercise to see how such a system might work. First, we must appreciate that the Earth is one interconnected biosphere and aligned with the natural laws which govern it as best we can. Our contrived notions of separation are arbitrary and meaningless when viewed in this way. We then need to know what resources are available on the planet by doing a global resource survey, which can be achieved by using satellites and sensors. We would then need a system to manage the rates of use, depletion, and regeneration of these resources to maximize economic efficiency and maintain dynamic equilibrium. The 
best tool for taking all known variables into account for this task is via the use of robust, open source computer and artificial intelligence based programs. Helping us to arrive at more appropriate decisions with strategic efficiency, redundancy, and preservation protocols built in. In a natural law resource based economy, we would build recyclable goods to last rather than sell. Localize production and distribution where possible for the obvious efficiency that it would bring. And automate monotonous and dangerous human labor rather than restrict it to maintain employment. And build society with strategic proximity in mind to allow for a shared access um, to the means of life rather than the ownership of it. And we saw some of this, this list in David Dan's um, presentation earlier, but it's, it's wor worthwhile taking, taking a look at the... Uh, difference between what we're going for and what we currently have. Um, by doing this, we technically minimize the need for the continuation of this immature, wasteful status and scarcity driven practice of ownership wherever possible. But no one's going to take away your stuff. Just saying. Right. So here are some examples of what could be achieved by using this systems theory approach to planetary management. Complete renewable energy abundance. By harnessing just 20% of the uh, wind energy, we could supply half the world's energy needs. With the exponential increase in nanotechnology when applied to the harnessing of solar radiation, we could supply all our energy needs a thousand times over in the not too distant future. The combination of all water-based energy technology could supply 96% of the world's energy. And geothermal energy has been estimated to contain enough potential to power the world for the next 4,000 years. Food. Through the use of permaculture, hydroponics, and aquaponics, we can now produce an abundance of fresh food locally and with a negligible adverse environmental effect. Take hydroponics, for example, which is the growing, uh, the soilless growing of plants in nutrient-rich water. Uh, when grown in rotating cylinders like this, um, we, we only have to, we use a lot less power for the UV lights to power them. So rather than you having UV lights over the top of a bed of, of these, you can have one in the middle and you've saved on power like that. And of course, by rotating them slowly, you're, you're tricking the plants essentially by using gravity to make them grow up to 30% faster than current farming methods. If you house uh, all this in a building like this with one acre floor space, 10 stories high, it could produce as much agricultural yield as 400 acres of farming land. It uses 99% less water than the current 70% we use in current farming methods. Speaking of water, we have many ways of producing fresh drinking water as well, like desalination, which I'm sure we're all familiar with but also atmospheric water generators, which can actually produce fresh drinking water by extracting it from the moisture in the air around you. And the Lifesaver bottle, pictured here, that can be dunked into a dirty stream, pumped a few times, and voila, fresh drinking water, which is great news for the 780 million people currently affected by this problem on a planet 71% covered in the stuff. Housing. We can now 3D print entire building structures and put them up in a fraction of the time and resources currently used in the most dangerous and resource labor intensive job that we engage in today. Dome structures could be built instead as they are far more energy efficient, resilient and resource intensive. We could build our bathrooms so that the gray water from showers and sinks could be reused to water our garden and fill our cisterns so that we're not using clean water to flush our poopies and wee-wees. So transportation wise, as mentioned earlier, we can uh, build uh, electric cars that drive themselves, don't crash into each other and go at speeds of up to 100 miles an hour for 200 miles on a single battery charge. But the patents for this technology are currently being withheld by the automotive industry. Long distance travel could be achieved by maglev trains. These trains are suspended on a rail by magnetism to reduce friction and if housed in an airtight tube to reduce drag, they could reach speeds of up to 4,000 miles an hour safely. They're clean, they use just 2% the energy of planes, which are the biggest travel contributor to CO2 emissions. So, 
If we acknowledge that global warming, poverty, and environmental sustainability are issues we must address, then why are we not using the best available technology to address them? Clearly, we can't have this many solutions available and still claim that it has nothing to do with our social system. I'm sorry, but in the words of Mr. Jacques Fresco, this shit's got to go. Part three, join the movement. The question should never be, do we have the money to solve problems? It should always be, do we have the know-how and the resources to do so? And the answer to that question is yes, we do. The technological approach is often counterintuitive to how it relates to seemingly unrelated human problems. Think back to driverless cars. With approximately 1.2 million people dying on the roads of this planet every year, can we really say these deaths have no negative effects on society? Obviously not. But instead of solving these, this issue technically, we pass laws and imprison the guilty party so that it never happens again. But that's just it. It does happen again. Again. And again, and again. It's our system that's doing this to us. And it must be overcome before it overcomes us. So we need your help in any of these areas, please. But if you don't want to fly our flag, no problem. Please do pick up someone else, else's who looks like they're roughly going the same direction and who is doing it for, for a bit more than just the money. Because in the wise words of my good friend Ben McLeish, if you're only doing it for the money, it was probably not worth doing to begin with. A common objection to this train of thought is that we'll never get everyone to agree, to which I would say you're absolutely right. But an awful lot of people don't agree with this system they still have to endure it simply because they don't have a better idea. What if they did? We've changed before and we can do it again. Studies show that if 10% of a population want to run with an idea, then the rest will start to follow. But let's entertain the very real possibility that this may actually never come about. Now what are you going to do? Go back to watching X Factor, shopping and pretending everything's okay? Or embrace the idea that life is a journey, not a destination, and refuse to give up or compromise on what you know makes sense and say, my integrity is worth more than that. Besides, our problems will not end when we get to this world because it's not a utopia, there's no such thing, there never has been and there never will be. It's just going to be a damn sight better than what we have now. Ideas matter, and once properly questioned and understood, this idea is definitely one worthy of spending at least some of the only currency you've ever really had in your brief time here on Spaceship Earth. A currency which you are, in fact, parting with as I say these words to you right now. time. Thank you for spending some of yours with us today. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, any, uh, any questions for myself, I suppose? Um, oh, obviously, we're going to have a Q&A &A, um, after the, the next talk as well, but we'll, I'll take a few brief brief questions now, maybe regarding what I spoke about, so. Hello, um, has any of the, uh, you know, food producing towers the, for vegetable and so, has any of them have actually been built and see how they work in the world? 
Yes, uh, there's been um, uh, some of these built in Singapore, and there's a company called Omega Towers, I believe. Uh, I met the guy who actually invented that technology. There's other uh, programs that are getting off the ground with that. There's something called CFS, which is headed by one of um, our advocates, Doug Douglas Millet. Um, I don't know how far he's got along with uh, the lines of doing that, but yes, the, I, I, the one in Singapore is one you can punch up online and have a look. They're, they're currently uh, producing food in this way. Yeah. Sorry? I'm not familiar with that, but it's definitely recommended. Did say that again? Dixon de Pommier. Dixon de Pommier. Okay, all right, that's one for, for me to write down in a minute then. Uh, so, yeah. Hi, James. <clears throat> Thanks for the talk. Um, I just wanted to ask about your success in the schools that you're, that you're doing. Um, how is it going? Because it's obviously my belief that the next generation will be carrying things forward. So uh, how is that looking? Um, it's, it's go it, well, it could be going a lot better. Let's put it that way, because I, I'm, I, I, you know, I can't, we, myself and Sarah can't do this <coughs> alone. So our website, um, tzmeducation.org is up online and has all of the resources you could possibly ever need to go into schools and talk about this. I've been to about 15 to 20 schools to talk about this stuff, um, which surprises many of our members. They say, how did you do that? Because they obviously think I go, I'm from the Zeitgeist Movement, we want to get rid of money, can we come and talk about it? You know, obviously I don't do that. Um, you know, I go in there and um, you, you've got to go for the low-hanging fruit and you've got to ask questions that you already know you're going to get the right answer to. So when I phone up a school, I always say, tell me, does your school like science? Yeah. <laughs> Do you like the environment and sustainability? Well, yeah. So when shall I come in and talk about that? Done. Easy. You, you know, we, we have to take the path of least resistance here when we're, we're dealing with our communications, and that is something that hit me when I came to my first C day in 2010 and I sat there and it just clicked. I just went, oh, holy shit, we have to go and talk to kids about this. They, it, they just punch through the bullshit so much faster than adults. If you, you have to see it with your own eyes to believe it. Um, I mean, a, a story I shared here, here last year, but for, forgive me for repeating it because I just love it so much, is we've got an exhibition which does the rounds with a lot of this technology that's on it that I take into schools and I show kids. And I had this wonderful moment where this 14-year-old um, lad came up next to me as I was standing there in front of the exhibition and I went, whoa, you mean to say we can do all this? I went, yep. And he went, why aren't we doing it then? And I said, oh, well, we haven't got the money. And he said, pff, pff, money's dumb. I was like, that was quick. <laughs> Wicked. You know, you know how long that takes <laughs> to get that across? Um, so, uh, and, and you know, other, like a, even a seven-year-old once said, he's like, well, I've got an idea. Seeing as money's just like paper anyway, why don't we just make enough of it to build all these things and then they'll be done? <laughs> I was just like... Oh, can you be running for office, please? <laughs> you know? um, so, no. Uh, so, it's, it, goes, it goes really well. And you know what? It, even if it, it doesn't go that great, at least we're planting seeds that are, if you've been paying any attention to the upcoming election campaign, they're not going to be planted by your media anytime soon. So, if we're not going to go into the schools and do it, you know, then who is? Clearly not the Sun newspaper or anybody, you know, or whatever it might be, yeah? So, um, and don't be put off if you think, well, it's a bit daunting to sort of go and, you know, talk to, to kids. You've got to try things to, to, you know, to be good at them. And, and so, for instance, like with public speaking, um, I don't really know c conclusively whether I'm, I'm a good public speaker or not one, but the fact is, is as I said, someone has to do this. We need more people talking for this movement, okay? It can't just be me, Peter Joseph, and Ben McLeish who do the rounds all the bloody time, yeah? We need more people doing it. For instance, I don't have the time to continue our events at the Elixir Bar in, in London at the moment, so we need someone else to sort of take over. By the way, uh, can you put the list of all the sh chores or... Chores? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, actually, uh, yeah. Right. So that everybody yes. can see. Housekeeping. Um, it, we're, the list that I, 
The list that I, I put up there briefly, um, we will put up during uh, the Q&A, um, as long as someone reminds me, because we've got a memory like a sieve. Um, the, and, and we will be producing that list on the Meetup page for this site, and through our, if you haven't signed up to us on Meetup, sign up on that, because going forward, we need more structure in this movement. We have positions that need filling. We need, you know, we need to move forward with this in a much more structured way than we have been doing. Um, so we definitely need help on that. Sorry, I gas bagged for ages. That's the longest answer to that question I think I've ever given. Um, another question? Um, what do you do when you explain... I'm oh, sorry, wait for What do you do when you explain to someone what the movement is about, but then they kind of reject it or don't really understand it fully? It, it depends on who you're talking to. So you have to... And I wouldn't say I've got the art perfected, otherwise I would have convinced everybody I ever met, I suppose. But sometimes people don't have the predisposition to, to hear what you have to say, you know? And we have to try to recognize this because there's, there's an awful lot of people on this planet and not a lot of us. And if we're going to go about doing this in a really stupid, haphazard way, it ain't gonna happen. So this is something that critically, I don't think even movement members properly appreciate. We, they, in my view, they spend an awful lot of their time debating Stefan Molyneux fans or some stupid shit like that. People who are just not going to understand what you're trying to say. So go to like-minded organizations' events, speak at their events. Um, so Sarah here is, 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 got in touch with uh, a recent event, a sustainability event that's going on, and um, I can't make it. She said, well, what are we going to do? And I said, well, you're going to go do a talk. So get in touch, send them stuff, and have a good time. She's dreading it, bless her, as I'm sure we all would, but you know, people like her deserve a round of applause. Give her a round of applause. You know, um, there's, 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 lots of line, there's lots of lines of argumentation you know, that, that come into this. I, I usually, I try to fall on the line of striking the common ground first. So if someone says, well, all these feckless layabouts, you know, they don't do anything, they just claim that my dull money. The way I come at that is I say, I completely sympathize, man. I cannot stand lazy bastards. You know, they just sit around whilst I'm plowing the field. You know, disgraceful, isn't it? Or something, so you sympathize first, and then you say, but you know what? Technology's taking over an awful lot of jobs. So I don't know, I feel like work should be something that benefits society. How do you feel about that? It's the same thing with the science question in schools. Give them a question they can only say, well, I think it should benefit society. Yeah, you see, I do too. That's why I'm not so sure that the sort of head of RBS is really doing the best thing for us. What do you think? Boom, you're in. I don't know. That's, is, you know we've got to try and strike the common ground as best as possible. Um, right, okay, I think I've probably talked long enough. And there's, Should we take one more question? N no. No, naughty James, who loves the sound of his own voice far too much. Right, okay, so um, bear with me whilst I just uh, get the next presentation ready. <laughs>